Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is part five of the fantastic series by the wonderful mind of Edward Ed Smith. As ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help with the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. Entitled... The Gugway Siege of Red Oak, Oklahoma. Payback, clarity of thought is sometimes even more terrifying. Let's get straight into that. The clock on the wall said 11.38 a.m. I hardly had been sitting in the interview room for about an hour before the chief walked in. Hi, I'm Chief Jennings, and sorry it took so long, but we're operating with one hand tied around our nuts right now. Well, hello, sir. Harley Jones, he smiled back. My secretary, assistant, dispatcher, and the one who keeps me in between the lines said, you have an interesting story to tell me? The chief stated. Yes, sir. Well, it was two days ago, Harley spoke. Harley finished his story, and the chief looked dazed and even a little irritated. You know, my first inclination is to have you thrown into the drunk tank and drug test you. But considering what's happened here in town in the last 48 hours or 72 hours, I think we both should have a drink, Chief Jennings said. Well, Harley, if you was in my position, what do you think we should do next? The chief asked. Look, these things are deadly. They're ambush predators, pack hunters, and they are tough to kill. I have no idea what they are, but they look like baboons. But then they walk like we do. Their strength is incredible. And they stink. And they're smart. Why they are here and we only now just know about them, I don't know. My farmhand Lin Harrow told me that his tribe has folk tales of these things. And that they have been here for a long time. I don't know if I believe it, but it's wild stuff, Chief. We need to get some help in here. County, state, feds. Maybe they have some insight that we don't, Harley said. The chief briefed Harley as to the condition of the roads, the town, and the communications. And Harley said, Okay, chief. Look, if we took some radios and our cell phones up on Red Oak Peak, that location might have enough elevation to reach out to county repeaters and the state highway patrol control network, or Oklahoma emergency management. That peak is like, what, 1,425 feet or better? We should be able to get a hold of someone. I'm short on staff. I can't spare anyone. If I got you some help, do you think you could pull that off? The chief questioned. Yes, sir. But I'm going to need some guys that have their shit wired tight. Former military would be helpful, and we're going to need a couple of heavy 4x4s just to get up that goat trail. They call a logging route, Harley stated. Okay, well, let me pull some people together, the chief affirmed. Oh, one other thing. Judging from how these things operate, we should get the townsfolk into one locale spot. That is defendable, and it will be easier to establish a perimeter and layer in protection for them. It's better to protect one target than many targets spread all over the place, at least in this instance, Harley stated once more. Officer Janice walked by the interview room and looked through the window. Harley's back was to the window. Who is the perp the chief is interviewing? He asked Katie Patterson, a part-time dispatcher. Oh, that's, um, oh, Harley Jones, she stated. What? he exclaimed. Janice pushed open the door and said, Chief, you can't be serious about talking to this lunatic, he said with an exclamation. What are you talking about, officer? Harley said, puzzled. This man is a hot-headed maniac. He can't be trusted, Janice said. This lowlife busted out five of my brother's teeth, cracked his fucking jaw and broke three of his damn ribs. Officer Janice, calm down now, Chief said loudly. Okay, that's enough. Your brother came at me with a broken beer bottle. Chief, it's apparent that he has something against me because his younger brother had a drunken dumbass moment and I dealt with him, Harley said while looking at Janice and rising to his feet. Please, make that jump, ranger boy. I'll mop the floor with you and then I'll show you your cell, you son of a bitch, Janice exclaimed. All right, that's it. Officer Janice, get out of this room right now. Chief said in an agitated manner and standing up with authority. 
Chief, you cannot be listening to this guy. He's drunk and nothing but trouble. How much dope have you done today, Jones? Janice said. Officer, get out! The chief yelled. Janice turned and walked out and slammed the door. Uh, yeah, chief, sir, I've had some problems in my life. The first year I was back from the military, but I have set myself straight and I'm centered and sober. Harley said with a somber resignation to his situation as he sat down on the chair with his elbows on his knees, looking at the floor. I'm sorry, Mr. Jones. He has a bug in his butt about you, Chief said apologetically. Oh, look, Chief, I just want to live my life quietly and work my farm, but now I just want to survive. I don't have time for this high school crap, Harley said with frustration. I'll take care of him. Here's a pad of paper. Can you write down the steps we need to take to get our act together? It's going to be dark in about eight hours, the chief said while handing him a pad and a pen. The chief turned and walked out and went to talk to the dispatcher on duty. Harley had about two pages of notes when chief walked back in and they talked for about 30 minutes more and then Harley left for his farm to get his weapons and equipment for the trip up the peak. The chief then walked over to Janice and said, I need to see you in my office now, Janice. The officer walked in and he shut the door. It was time for a come to Jesus meeting. Sit down, Janice. The chief lit into the officer with vigour and a trophy winning coach at a big game and his quarterback hasn't realised it's game day. History repeats and sometimes it repeats again. Evelyn Tucker was just getting out of bed. When she truly realised what had happened the night before, she threw a Tonya Tucker Rules t-shirt and her sweatpants on and went down to find her dad, and she reprised the night's events. While walking down to her dad, she remembered the reactions of the people at the mud park when she told them what transpired, and well, she didn't know how her dad would handle it. The dudes and the girls at the park laughed at her until she challenged them to go look for themselves. They found Billy's truck and what was left of Ty and the boys. And half of the group lit up out of there faster than shit through a gooseback home. And the other half grabbed guns, knives and axe handles and rolled out on a redneck throwdown. They found the body of the drowned Gugwe underneath Billy's tire and were horrified by the sight of it. This did not discourage them from continuing to look around the park and surrounding area for about four hours or so. When they gave up and decided... They needed to report what happened and what they found on the property. Jerry Dalton, Billy's 19-year-old brother, found Billy's Cowboys Ride It Longer hat. And this was his favourite. At the beginning of the wall line, he and several other boys and a couple of girls looked for Billy for three hours and they came across a trail of disturbed grass, dirt and mud that led on for about 150 yards but lost it inside a dense area of undergrowth of privet bushes. These things intertwine and get about 30 or 40 feet tall, and there's some massive green limbs all the way down to the ground. At the point of where it looked like Billy or something ran into the undergrowth and disappeared into the maze, a faint stench hit their nostrils. This puzzled and startled them, as it was nothing that they had ever smelled before. The group convinced Jerry to leave so they could tell the others and get a bigger search party out to start a real search. And Jerry was hesitant to leave, but he finally agreed. As they left the woodline while walking back to the park, he looked back into the woodline and said to himself, I'll be back, brother. Evelyn sat and told her dad about the night and how scared she was. He turned to the fireplace and looked at the pictures of his dad, Doak Tucker, and his dad and his grandpa grew up around here. Doak was 47 and hunted and fished these hills and woods for all of his life. And then he turned to his daughter and said, Little girl, I had hoped that you would never see those things. Dad, you knew those fucks were out there? She raised her voice. Girl, watch your mouth, he said in a very fatherly tone. I was eight years old. It was in the fall and I was out looking for deer signer with your uncle Blake and our friend Hank. We were deep up in the Kiamishi Mountains we was about seven miles from your grandpa's house. I guess it was mid-afternoon. We'd been looking for game trails and, well, we found one. It seemed to be a lot larger than the normal trails that deer would follow. But we figured that whatever made it had to be a big buck. And we were hard after those big bucks in those days. 
and the three of us followed that trail for, oh, about a mile, I guess, when we got to a fork in the trail. One went up the ridge line, and the other went down in the hollow that jutted out of the valley that was between Baker's Ridge and Fire Tower Mountain. You know, the one I took it to, just off the K-Trail last year. And she nodded and sat back. Well, we decided that we would go down into the hollow. Ooh, man. God, that place was spooky. The further we went down the trail, those woods got darker and thicker. I was just a boy. Your Uncle Blake was 14 and Hank, he was 16. Hank was in front and Blake was in the middle. And I was walking behind them. The trail got narrow and the path was sloping fairly steep in places and the woods were so dense. It seemed to create wars on each side of us. I told Blake that I was scared and wanted to go back and he said, No, stop being a baby. And so I just trudged on. Went on to another quarter mile or so and that's what put us down in the bottom of the hollow. And that's when we smelled the stink. Ooh, we it smelled like... When Evelyn said, run and meet poop and pee, Doug looked at his daughter and said, you really have seen it. Yeah, Dad. It killed those guys at the park. All right. All right, he said. I believe you. We walked on for about a 300 yards or so. The smell got worse and that's when we heard it. From our left out of the dense brush, a low growl. It was about 200 feet maybe away from us. It sounded big, but... It was so loud that it made my stomach shake. When Blake said, Hank, what is that? He said he did not know. Maybe a hawk. Blake said that it didn't sound like any hawk he'd ever heard. We stood there pretty much not wanting to move. We started hearing movement in the same direction of the growl, then back and to the right of us. We heard what seemed to be an owl caught of sorts. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Almost like a tongue pop against the top of your mouth, that's when I knew it wasn't an owl. Blake, I hear something over this side. As I pointed, Hank said, whatever it is, there's more than one. Hank pushed past Blake and me. Boys, let's kick it out of here. Blake went on past me and so I was behind him and we started walking out. Well, we went about 250 yards and we started hearing movement on both sides of us and it seemed to be getting closer. It was hard to tell, with the dense brush and all, but we kept on moving. When then we heard a loud roar from the rear of us, it sounded close. All three of us turned and pointed our shotguns. Hank and Blake had 12 gauges, and Hank had his pump and my brother had his double barrel. I had my 410 bolt action pea shooter. We stood there for a minute or so, and we didn't see anything. In the low light of the hollow, the stink was horrible. Okay boys, we gotta go. Hank said in the tone of a quarterback in a football game. We started down the path. When a hand reached back and grabbed my hunting vest and it poured me in front of my brother, he told me not to get out of his sight and to stay in front of him. And we were almost to the part in the trail that started up and out of the hollow when a big tree came crashing down across the trail and landed with a terrible thunderous crash. As it landed from left to right, we jumped back and at the sight of the noise, when we did, we heard the roar again. We started hearing large footsteps coming down from the trail behind us and off to the right of us. Run! Hank yelled. We ran to the tree that had fallen and Hank jumped over the trunk of the very large tree. And Blake grabbed me and lifted me over the trunk of the tree and Hank grabbed me and threw me up the trail. Hank grabbed Blake's hand and as he was pulling Blake across the trunk of the tree, a limb came flying and just missed Blake, barely. We got moving and started climbing up the trail towards the ridge. Hank moved to the side of the narrow trail and said, Doke, Blake, get in front of me. Keep moving no matter what you hear. You understand? Keep moving. I never moved quicker in all of my life. Even when I used to come home drunken, your mama would chase me out of the house with a pistol for being an asshole to her. He said with an anxious embarrassment. Well, Blake and me were about halfway up to the ridge, we heard Hank pumping off rounds like a madman. We heard Hank yelling, Move, boys! Move! And we heard another series of blasts from his shotgun. And when we got to the top of the ridge at the fork of the trail, where it was actually daylight, our eyes winced in a bright sunlight. And we were looking down the trail that we had just come up. Where the hell is he? I said. Blake started back down the trail. I started to follow him. 
and Blake screamed at me, Get your butt back down the trail and don't stop until you get home. Move it now. And well, I yelled back, Not without you, brother. It's not going to happen. As we started down the trail into the hollow again, Hank was literally running, like he was running a set of bleachers in a football practice up the trail. Run, you idiots! Run! We hit the ridge trail and about 200 feet down the trail we heard a screeching howl and a loud low growl. All three of us turned and that's when I got my first look at these things. I was 14 when I finally knew what a baboon looked like. Did these things resemble a baboon? Evelyn nodded her head yes. Did they have a bristled mane like a lion covering the head, neck and down the shoulders? She again nodded. Or did they have long arms that hung down to their knees and were those shoulders manlike? Continuing to nod and tearing up in her eyes, and then she said, They have hands and claws, reddish brown on black fur. And then he nodded. And they look like demons from hell, she said. I'll never forget them, as tears run down her cheeks. I'm sorry, Dad. They just scare me. Don't apologize, little girl. I still cry when that memory crosses my mind. I think it's their eyes that scare me the most. It's like they can see you. All they want to do is shake you to your soul. He lamented and wiped his eye. He pointed to her left arm, and I had a bandage on it. Did they do that? And she nodded. Well, let's get that cleaned up good. I'll get the first aid kit, he said. Hey, Alan, come here, he called to his wife. Oh, what do you want, honey? I'm busy, she said, frustrated. You're not busy anymore, sweet pea. I want you to have your pistol on you all the time now. And Evelyn, you keep your shotgun in arm's reach at all times. Ellen looked puzzled. Tell your mama what happened last night, he said with a determination, so to make his wife understand the gravity of the situation. After Evelyn told her story, her mama had a hard time believing her until her dad told his story. He finished by saying, once we emptied our shotguns at them, they started to walk towards us. They jumped off the trail and that was the last we see of them. When we got back home, we vowed to never talk about it to anyone. Today is the first I have spoke about it to anyone other than Blake. Your Uncle Blake won't talk about it to anyone other than me. And Hank, huh, he just won't talk about it. Evelyn, honey, even your grandpa, my daddy, told me he had seen them when he was a young man. Why are they moving up and out of those deep hollows? Is anyone's guess. Maybe food, but I think there is just more of them. They have been here a long time, probably longer than us. Fire Tower Mountain, isn't that where that hunter went missing last year? Asked Ellen. No, that was up in South Tulsa, down in the Deep Fork River bottom. They never found him, Doak said, and probably never will. A message to our enemy. Never fuck with the one who's had to fight for being free. Over at the Red Oak Firehouse, Chief Jennings was calling out the names of the peak team as it has been named. Jamison Boyd, 24. Mike Wallace, 29. Floyd Beebe, 28. Andy Sturgeon, 29. Tracy Norman, 27. And Harley Jones, 32. You guys are on the peak team. Harley is your man in charge of the team and your task is to get up to Red Oak Peak and transmit the calls for assistance and get back as soon as you can to help protect the safe site. All of you have military combat experience. You men have the ability to get this important task done and lives depend upon it. Harley, take your team and get it organized and it will be dark in less than four hours. They huddled up into one corner of the firehouse garage where everything was being staged. As the peak team huddled up, the lockdown team for the safe site had been working on the old high school gymnasium. This building was built in the early 1930s by the Civil Works Administration or CWA. It was a stone and steel structure that was overbuilt to put it mildly. The windows were some 25 feet off the ground and the glass is made from a steel grid mesh sealed inside the glass. The doors were still and had small windows in the top quarter of the door. And there were two basements in the building, one under the stage area and also housed a large fireplace. Yes, fireplace respective of the era that it was built. One basement was at the end of the gym 
and was the location of the locker rooms. The other basement was underneath the basketball court and this large area was for storage. This building was going to be the local safe site for the duration of whatever time would be required to keep the population of the town safe and secure. The lockdown team began to fortify the building by reinforcing the windows by using screws and boards to cover them and welding plate steel over vents into the building. Bracing the doors with steel pipe made into the floor, bracing the guard against the door being pushed in. A large number of car batteries were brought in and wild into the parallel, so low wattage lighting could be utilised in the case of a power cut. Several pallets of bottled water and other snacks, as well as baby formula, were brought in from the local grocery and convenience stores. Several cameras were set up outside and wired so command posts would not be blind while locked in the site. Jack Ellers was found in his diner's reefer and was put in charge of the lockdown team. Some three dozen military veterans were also assigned to the team and many of the town's young men and not so young were involved in the building and crafting the defences of the site. The population of the town began arriving with what they could carry. Broke down cots were assembled and they were placed with anyone who wanted one. There was a medical area and an area for the children that were less than one year old. A canteen area was also provided for comfort and necessity of purpose for the shelter. The storage area of the basement would serve as a fallback safe room just in case the perimeter was breached and it was being beefed up to support that purpose. As the veterans began prepping the site for a defensive operation, more and more local town folk arrived with towers of their own deadly encounters with these beasts, many of them armed with pistols, shotguns and rifles. Even several crossbows were in the arsenal. It was about two hours before nightfall. After Jerry Dalton returned and told the story of what had happened and what he had found at the mud park to his mom, he began getting and packing together his dad's rifle, a standard AR-15 platform, eight 20 round magazines, a 45 caliber pistol and a standard hunting knife that every country boy has laying on his dresser. He finished tying his boots and was loading his truck for the return trip to the park when Connor Billings drove up in his truck. And so far, he is the only one to show and he began to load his equipment into Jerry's truck. Jerry's mum walked out onto the porch. Jerry baby, just, just wait until your dad gets back this evening. I would go with you but I have to stay here and watch the twins. Please Jerry, please, she said almost in tears. Mom, you haven't seen what these things can do. Billy's out there. He could get hurt. I can't leave him out there. He will come looking for me and you know this, Mom. When Dad gets in, send him out our way, Jerry stated. Hey, the people in town are getting together over at the old gym. They're grouping up in there to stay safe. Mrs. Dalton, I think you should go there, Connor said. Yeah, Mom, go there. That way I know you're safe. Look, Mom, Connor and me, we can take care of ourselves. You know this. Dad beat it and stomped it into Billy and me. And please go, Jerry pleaded. Okay, Jerry, I'll leave just after you go, she said reluctantly. Jerry hugged his mum and Connor got in the truck. And Jerry walked over to the driver's side door and said, I love you, Mum. And she turned and walked into the house. He started the engine and tore out of the drive and hit the dirt road in front of his house. When he pulled into the entryway of the mud park, it was just about three hours before dark. When Connor said, Hey, Bubba, where do you want to start? Over at the wood line, where we tracked it to the privet tangle. It's sure to be quiet. As they drove the follow on road over to the location on their way, they passed Billy's trunk. And Connor asked, Are you okay, brother? And with a big breath, he nodded his head and said, Yeah, I'm going to have to be for right now. As they passed, Connor noticed that the bodies of Justin and Mike were missing. Even the body of the Gugway was now missing, and there were drag trails leading off into the opposite wood line. He pointed this out to Jerry, and they kept driving to the location. They got out of the truck and grabbed all of their gear and equipment. They stood side by side and looked at each other, and Connor said, well, Let's do this, Bobber. And with that, they took off to the wood line. One foot in front of the other. That's just fine, until your legs get bitten off. As the intensity of the preparations increased at the firehouse, Jemison Boyd, Mike Wallace, Floyd Beebe, 
Andy Sturgeon, Tracy Norman and Harley Jones made final preparations for the trek up the peak road. The team has two off-road trucks and an array of weapons, equipment and supplies. The lead vehicle was being manned by Andy Sturgeon, Tracy Norman and Harley Jones. The follow-on vehicle was being manned by Jameson Boyd, Mike Wallace and Floyd Beeb. The Como gear has been loaded into both vehicles with extra batteries and antenna bundles. Harley called all the team together and gave them his version of a mission briefing. Brothers, I'm not going to bullshit you, this is going to get rough. These things are smart, strong and they like to throw rocks and, well, anything they can do to disable you, so they can get to you. They are deadly and they stink. They communicate with each other and they coordinate as a group when they're hunting. They are pack hunters on steroids. These things are vicious, tough and I mean, they are hard to bring down. These sons of bitches are just as effective in the tree canopy as they are on the ground. You must remember to look up into the trees and when you get a shot to take it, headshots are best. Targeting the torso is a no-go because you're going to have to hit them 10 or 20 rounds and we don't have that much ammunition considering the number of freaking things out there. No one dismounts alone. If you must go into the ground pound mode for any reason, make sure that all three of you are within six feet of each other. If we must abandon the vehicles, then we will form a two by one, three cover formation. If we must take that decision, then you must remember the Como equipment. No bullshit, boys. We must complete this mission. Lives of our loved ones and people in this town are counting on us. Boys, our skin is in this game. And I'm not going to stand here and tell you that this is going to end well. It's a gamble. Simply put, if we run into them, it's going to be a fight like you have never fucking been in before. I know all of us have been in harm's way and I would rather be in a firefight with any enemy than to be in a fight with these things, Harley stated with resolve. And we will travel to this location. He pointed to a spot on the topo map. Once there, we will set up a defensive perimeter and then we will set up a commo equipment. When we have made contact and info was passed to the county or state or both, we will come back via this route. He pointed to a road location on the map. Guys, it's going to be dark in about an hour, so keep your eyes open. Use the night vision that we have provided. Remember these things smell and trust your spider sense. If that hair goes up on the back of your neck, then you better trust it, Harley said with a nod. Any questions, boys? stated Harley. And Jameson said, I think I'll sum it up for all of us. We don't like this shit, but we'll do it, because it has to be done. And so, Harley, just make it count, brother. The rest nodded in affirmative. Okay then, let's saddle up and get rolling, Harley said. Safety is relative. Believing you're safe is foolish. Hoping you're safe is tragically stupid. Calculating your safety, if not this, then that, priceless. Chief Jennings gave the order to evacuate the police station and everyone is to relocate to the safe site. The preparations were continuing at the site when the police department transferred its operations to the old gymnasium. The chief confirmed with Jake Ellers, who had been coordinating the safe site build-out and town evacuation with the lockdown team, if the town's population had been relocated. He confirmed that 80% of the population had been accounted for, but the rest of them were missing. Unknown or it had been confirmed that they had met their demise, based on finding remnants of an attack or other factors. 448 souls accounted for, and Chief, that is the best we can do, Jake added. So Jake, if that's everybody, the Chief stated. Jake nodded to the affirmative. The Chief gave the order to lock down the site and seal the perimeter. We have done all we can do at this point, Chief, Jake said. Watches are now posted, and we are actively securing the site and perimeter, Jake stated. So, it's up to the vicious bitch called Luck now, the Chief exclaimed. As the sunset turned the sky into a brilliantly colourful kaleidoscope against the darkening blue lustre of the Oklahoma July summertime sky, while the trees cast long dark shadows against the green canvas of the wooded line of trees, before the last of the daytime breezes waned away. The Gugway Potter woke and fed on the scraps of flesh and bone laying around the nest area. The disappearing rays of sunlight faded and the Alpha snorted and whooped. 
the other gugway of the pod began to stir. The sentries were echoing the whoops back and the farthest one was whacking on the tree. And this acknowledgement was meant to let the pod know that there were no threats or other intrusions to the area. The pack was now gathering for the night's forage. Harley radioed to the safe site via Yamaha handheld two-way radio to Chief Jennings that they were rolling out of town and would be out of the radio range in about 20 minutes. Chief called back and wished them luck. Harley responded that he wished them the same. The two off-road trucks rolled down the small two-lane road, now about two miles outside of town, as the headlights and banks of the off-road driving lights blazed. The lights fell upon a vehicle that looked like a squad car far up the road. As the trucks drew closer, they could plainly see that the car was a squad car and a county sheriff vehicle. The windshield was smashed in and at least two tires were flat. They slowed and stopped next to the squad car and Harley ordered everyone but the drivers out and set about searching the vehicle and area around the vehicle, weapons at the ready. They found the car ripped open on the inside, blood was sprayed all over the interior. It appeared to be several days old and nothing was still fresh. Okay, this is weird. A squad car with a missing sheriff and uh, several days old. Why has no one come to search for him? Said Floyd out loud. The search of the area produced nothing, and so Harley ordered everyone back to the trucks. Roll us on out of here, barked Harley. About three miles down the road, they found out why no one had come to find the missing sheriff. Five vehicles come into view with the lights, two squad cars and three SUVs, all smashed and ruined on the side of the road and in front of the way of the road. A quick search of the vehicles revealed that this attack happened sometime this morning. Blood was fresher than the last, and the body parts were just showing rigor mortis. The boys shaking their heads to a negative, let's go, one of them said. The convoy of two continued for another two miles as they turned right onto the logging road. The narrow belly of one to one and a half lane dirt road is winding and rut riddled with the occasional large rock lying in the tires ruts, making it difficult to navigate. The undergrowth was very thick and at some places was spread across the roadway itself. After about 30 minutes, the trailing vehicle radioed that the engine temp was rising and they should stop and look at it before it gets critical. Harley told the driver of the lead vehicle to stop in the flattest area they could find and the vehicle came to a stop. Harley hopped out and motioned for the driver of the trailing vehicle to roll up as close as they could get to the rear of the truck in front. He told Andy and Tracy to dismount and scan the area up front and to the sides with the night vision equipment. He told Jameson and Floyd to do the same, only to the rear of the vehicle, and Mike, he would look at the engine of the overheating truck. After about seven minutes or so, they determined that the leak was coming from a C-clamp on one of the hoses, and it just needed to be tightened. About three minutes later, it was tightened. An extra coolant was added to the overflow, and as the thermostat on the engine opened up, it sucked the additional coolant back into the system. Mike closed the hood of the truck, and just then, a five-inch rock flew by his head and hit the windshield, causing a spiderweb crack in the passenger side. What the fuck? he shouted. Harley saw the rock in the light of the light bar as it whizzed past Mike's head and shifted his view to the direction it came from. He raised his weapon and unleashed three round bursts of gunfire. This created chaos amongst the others. Everyone keep your cool, hold your sectors of fire. They're moving around us, Harley yelled. The others were holding their positions with anticipation and dicklift that they had not felt since their deployment days. Harley heard a tree snap from roughly the same location and he sent another three round burst this time, a screaming howl erupted from the darkness of the same location. So, there you are, you fucker, Harley said quietly. Mike had his weapon up and ready, and he fired a burst of three rounds to the location of the howl. Another growling howl and heavy footsteps running away from the location of the howl. Anything on the night vision, Mike yelled. No one, nope, not over here either, as the voices from the others chimed in. Jameson kicked off one of those flashbangs, and Harley yelled towards the back of the caravan as he pulled the can from the cargo pocket of his right leg, popped the safety latch and pulled the pin. He tossed it about 40 feet into the woods and shouted, Kick it out! About five seconds later, the area was lit up with a flash of a lightning and a resounding boom. This sound shook his chest and insides. Sweet! he exclaimed. 
The forest erupted with whoops, howls and screeches and screams of the beasts and the movement sounded like a stampede of buffalo all moving away from the caravan with speed and haste. The brush and undergrowth was all in motion. I think we found something these fucks don't dig, baby. Andy said with glee and big board excitement. The others began to offer their admiration. Keep your heads, boys. Everyone mount up. All right, let's go, barked Harley. They mounted the trucks and began to move up the logging road. It seemed the further they travelled on the road, the rougher it got. They were basically crawling up the road at this point. They were about five miles from the peak right now. Keep sharp, boys, Harley said into the radio. After the pain of being flushed out of their attack on the caravan, the Alpha in charge of his troop began calling the troop back together again. They were hyper with disgust, frustration and anger towards their prey, and the Alpha settled them with a shriek of his anger and frustrated authority. She put two of her young Gugway in check with a slash of her claws across their backs, which seemed to calm the group. A few clicks with her tongue and a motion with her muscled right arm, and they were moving up the mountain to where she'd hoped would be their last ambush of the caravan and a tasty meal. What happens when the doorbell rings and it's not Domino's Pizza? You grab your shotgun. Jake Ellis sat in the makeshift control centre of the safe site, bathed in a glow of computer monitors that were displaying the 18 cameras that were hastily installed at the safe site that came online. And he was thinking about the encounter he had had with them in his diner. And there was just one of them and it was a damn challenge to get it off him. He didn't know how he was going to act if he saw more than one. Miles Denton walked in and said, I have checked all the entrances and we're locked in. Randy Pierce told me that there used to be a coal chute in this place and we're trying to find it. Jake nodded his head and said, Good, that could get problematic. As the Gugway moved into town, they began to break into the homes that were abandoned and unoccupied, sniffing around the dwelling and trying to detect where the prey it was Craven who got gotten off to. There were about 16 of them in the town right now, and with the bulk of them on their way, getting frustrated, the Alpha let out a thunderously loud call. Randy Pierce was up on the roof when he heard it. He got on the radio and called to Jake. Hey man, I don't know, but I think we've got one. Jake, get up here. I'm on the roof. And when Jake got to the roof, he was able to view the perimeter and was able to see the push rings that Stan Macy had constructed for them. Stan Macy is a combat engineer who served in the Vietnam War. Early in the build-on stage of the safe site, Stan had come to Jake with a plan to keep the things at bay, at least for a while. You see, he was an expert in the Nam-era style of warfare. Push rings were built in to push back the enemy while the friendly forces reorganized, regrouped, and or relocated. Fugas or Fu gas is a mixture of gasoline, naphthalene, mothballs, and styrofoam. This mixture would be placed into a 50-gallon barrel and then an explosive, C4, compound B, tannerite, will be placed into the bottom of the barrel. Then the top would be covered by a piece of scrap metal or the lid to the barrel that was cut out from. Then it was covered by a plastic garbage bag and duct taped in place. The barrels would be placed into a vertical 30 or 45 degree angle buried and have several sandbags piled up and over the barrel allowing the charge to be focused out of the opening of a least resistance. And these barrels would be placed in a staged rings around the perimeter, and this would allow for the multiple blasts for multiple pushbacks. Stan had gathered all required materials, and with the help of about 14 people, he created three push rings for the safe site perimeter. In Stan's words, we're gonna make believers out of them. Jake and Randy stood looking in the direction of the house, and from the view on the roof, they observed their first sighting of the Gugway that was moving into the area of the safe site. It was massive, about nine feet tall, bristled with hair, chest thick and muscular. Its head swiveled on its shoulders and its snout was that of a baboon and was clearly evident the arms hung down low enough that the fingertips of the beast were almost touching its knees. Clearly, this was a primate or an ape or monster. The teeth with a ripping and tearing and chewing with large canines protruding out of its mouth, and at the hands, yes, hands, clearly for manipulating, clawing and tearing with the two-inch claws on the end of them. 
The legs were muscular and hair covered, and the face cut. The face was scarcely covered with hair, but the snout had about three or five inches of hair. The head was crested with a bump and a longer, more bristled form of hair could almost be a mohawk-type style. The Gugwe moved down the street on the sidewalk, almost like it was a familiar area. This unsettled Jake while pointed at the creature. This son of a bitch has been here before, and we've never known about it. Damn freaky, Jake said. Okay, humor break. A Bigfoot, a Dogman, and a Gugwe go into a bar. Bigfoot orders a Budweiser and a shot of Bourbon. Dogman orders a Guinness and a shot of Jägermeister. Gugwe orders a Grasshopper with a splash of Zippet Didi Duda. And the bartender says, Hey, we don't serve your kind here. The Gugwe grabs the barkeep and rips his face off. Dogman says to Bigfoot, Now why do we go drinking with him? And Bigfoot says, He always picks up the tab. Okay, someone's going to find that one funny. Now back to the story. The logging trail got rougher, if that was possible, and the two off-road trucks continued up the logging road. When Tracy the driver noticed that a large tree was lying across the road and it seemed to still have its leaves, so it's a recent fall. Man, I don't like coincidences, brothers, said Andy. Okay, let's do this. Harley motioned with his hand. The lead vehicle stopped about 40 feet from the tree, and the follow-on truck stopped about 60 feet from the rear of the first. Everyone dismounted and they left the vehicle's engines running. Mike set about getting the chainsaw out and ready. And he got the logging chain out of the storage box and on the back of the truck bed, and the rest of the guys pulled security and scanned with the night vision goggles. Mike was about halfway through the tree trunk when a four-inch rock hit him in the upper back from behind and knocked him forward. And then there was a barrage of rocks being thrown from behind them, specifically from behind the follow-on truck. Jameson tore off running towards the second truck while firing off his weapon, as if he may have seen what was throwing the rocks. Harley followed on the opposite side of the road, his weapon up and ready, and as he got to the passenger side door, he seen a shadow moving across the road. He fired three shots, and the shadow reacted like it was hit and growled and howled as it moved out of view. Jameson, fall back! You're too far out! Harley spoke with authority. Everyone, hold your positions! Mike, are you okay? About the time he uttered these words, all the guys heard a crashing thud as the beast jumped into the truck bed of the lead vehicle. At about this time, Harley heard the chainsaw fire up. The creature jumped on top of the cab of the truck. As Mike was turning towards the commotion, he saw the Gugwe jumping from the cab towards him, razor sharp claws out, ready. He raised the chainsaw. Mike swung the bar of the chainsaw up and at the monster as it was descending upon him. The bar of the chain of the saw was moving at high speed chewed through the upper thigh of the beast as blood and tissue spewed from the wound. The creature's leg dropped away while the beast tumbled over him and onto the fallen tree, landed on the far side of the tree in the road. The beast laid on its back, screaming and writhing in pain and anger as its blood sprayed from its stump-like leg. Floyd ran and jumped over to the far side of the tree and with his weapon at the ready took aim and triple-tapped the creature in the head. The creature went motionless and silent. That's right, you pissfuck, Floyd said. And Tracy yelled, Floyd, behind you! He spun with his weapon in hand as the Gugwe was just emerging out of the undergrowth. It moved towards Floyd and he fired just as the beast tackled him and took him to the ground. The infuriated beast bit down on his left shoulder and the pressure of the bite was tremendous. His shoulder was protected by the Kevlar plate vest and so the teeth didn't penetrate but the bite force cracked his collarbone. Floyd yelled and screamed, Get it off me! Get it off me! And Andy sunk nine 308 caliber rounds into the right side of its chest. It didn't seem to phase it, and Andy yelled, I can't get a shot at his head! It's too close to Floyd! And while the beast was shaking him violently back and forth with its mouth, Floyd reached for his sidearm, unholstered it, and cocked the hammer and put it to the creature's head and fired six 45 caliber shots directly into the brain pan of this thing. The beast then collapsed on top of him. Its weight was crushing, and its blood sprayed him in his mouth and face. Andy and Tracy managed to pull the good weight off of him and got him to his feet. Goddamn thing tastes worse than its smell. Now that stinks all over me, damn it, he said angrily. Harley and Jameson returned to the front of the lead truck, and Harley asked Floyd if he was okay. 
Floyd's shoulder is messed up, but it will pull through, Andy said. Let's get the tree moved, boys. Everyone fall back close to the perimeter, Harley ordered. Mike finished cutting the tree trunk, and Jameson wrapped the logging chain around the trunk and attached it to the tow lug on the truck. And Floyd focused through the pain of his shoulder and backed up the truck and pulled the trunk of the tree clear of the road. All right, boys, let's get rolling. We have been here long enough. The two trucks moved further down the road at a slow pace, but at least they were moving. As the peak team approached the fallen tree, Jake was making his rounds and talking to the people taking shelter in the safe site when the radio crackled. Jake, you need to see this. Get to the CNC ASAP. He made his way through the maze of stuff, quickly stacked and placed in the site. The CNC, or Command and Control Center, was bristling with activity. Gary Harlow waved Jake over to his computer screens. I count 17 so far. All of them seem to be waiting for some reason to approach the building. They must know we're in here, said Gary. The screens were alive with movement. The Gugwe were moving and grouping up in alleys and other shadowy covered areas. They apparently didn't like the lights that were installed by the lockdown team. One of the creatures moved around the building over to where the locker room's door was located and attempted to open them. But they had been bolted closed and welded shut. This agitated the creature no end, but it still went looking about the perimeter area where the building met the ground. It seemed to be very interested in a certain spot just east of where the fireplace was located above the stage area. It walked away and then walked back. The beast moved to the corner of the building and whooped a couple of times. At that moment, the entire group of Gugwe ran to the building and began banging on the building's doors. The security cameras were sweeping around the perimeter and they seemed to be making a lot of noise, but very little attempt to gain any entry. And Gary said, What are they doing? And Jake replied, I'm not sure. They're just making noise. And this activity went on for about 20 minutes. As one of the cameras swept over the area next to the locker room doors, Jake noticed that a pile of dirt had appeared by the wall of the building. What the hell? said Gary. He then said, Why would it dig a hole? Just, it's going to hit the foundation. The horror of the reality hit Jake like ten tons of bricks. It's not looking for the foundation. It's looking for the coal chute, Jake said with a terrified look. Call the security team to the locker room staircase. Sound the alert, Jake said with urgency. Jake moved quickly and went to the table at the back of the CNC that served as his desk. He grabbed his rifle and his battle belt and made for the locker room staircase. When he arrived at the staircase, there was already part of the security team there and the others were just walking and running up. Hey, Gary, get someone with pieces of steel that were left over from the build-out. Get Dale and his welder over here quick, Jake said into the radio. Jake briefed the team and they descended into the locker room area. The team consisted of several veterans and the rest were people who wanted to help. Half of the team moved through the men's locker room first while the rest of the team checked out the women's locker room and nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary. Dale arrived with a steel and a welder. Hey boss, what's up? Dale asked from the top of the stairs. Jake called up to him, start welding those plates on the metal frame of that door and just leave us enough room to get out. Will do, answered Dale. Ron Kafer is one of the veterans on the team, and he came up to Jake and said, We looked at everything down here. We can't seem to find anything out of the ordinary. And Jake said, Nothing in the locker rooms? And Ron replied, We looked in the janitorial room, but a mechanical room was locked. Jake looked at Ron, and they both realized the oh fuck moment at the same time. And Jake said, Stack up on this room and get it open. The group had a T-post driver that served as a battering ram. They counted down and boom, the door flew open and the team rushed in and clearing the long room sector by sector. As they approached the back of the room where the coal chute and the second fireplace was located, the Gugway stepped out of the shadows from between the matrix of equipment in the room. It slashed and ripped to the first man's throat and blood sprayed across Ron's face as he was the second in line. Ron opened fire and blasted the creature's throat open. It screamed and fell floundering on the floor. Another creature jumped down through the old coal chute, landing onto the floor on both feet. A growled a roar that was deafening. The beast stepped forward and the second and third creature jumped down the chute following. 
Ron yelled, Back up! Back the fuck up! The remaining team members began backing up and firing their weapons in earnest. They were at a mechanical room door when Jake said, Everyone upstairs! Upstairs now! The group of nine began running upstairs, but they were slowed down by the opening left by Dale, where they had to crawl through the floor of the hallway. The firefight was intensifying, as some of the creatures fell, but were being joined by others coming down the chute. The team began retreating up the stairway, handing off weapons and equipment to get through the opening. When Ron yelled at Jake to get through the opening, as the creatures were moving up the stairways towards them. Jake dove through the opening and quickly retrieved his weapon and began to fire at the Gugway horde, moving further up the stairs. And just then, Ron's weapon bolt locked back and he was out of ammunition. He yelled, I'm out! Get through, Ron, get through! Jake ordered. Ron threw his weapon through the opening and dove through the opening himself. And at about that time, Jake's bolt locked back and he pulled his sidearm and began to fire. One of the beasts jumped forward and up the stairway and grabbed Ron's ankle, began to pull him back through the opening and down the stairs. Both men were yelling and screaming as Jake struggled to reload his pistol and hold onto Ron's hand. Another teammate poked a weapon through the opening and fired several shotgun blasts. This stunned Jake and he lost his hold on Ron's hand, and Jake was screaming, No, goddammit, no! Ron was pulled very quickly down the stairs. He grabbed onto the banister and the bracket that held it. It gave him some relief that he was able to stop his descent into what was certainly death. Then a beast reached up with his right hand and locked onto his plate vest. The creature's brute strength caused him to lose grip, and he was pulled down the staircase in moments. Jake started to climb back down the stairs when he was pulled back by his remaining teammates. Ron's screams were fading as he was being violently dismembered. In the hallway, Jake was desperately trying to get back down to get Ron and the others restrained him. And somebody said, Dale, seal the opening. He fitted a piece of steel over it and began to weld it in place. One of the Gugways shoved the steel and broke the weld bead. When one of the team guys grabbed the steel plates while the other fired several rounds into the creature's head. Yet, others were reaching through the opening and trying to sweep legs and anything into the aperture. Finally, a teammate using his legs pushed the steel plate back into the opening and yelled, Dale, weld! Dale, weld! Weld this damn thing! He struggled to maintain it in place and eventually, Dale had enough tack welds on it so he could put the final weld bead in place. The Gugway continued to beat and smash at the welded steel plate. Chief Jennings was in the hallway and told everyone to get back to the CNC. And Dale said, I'm going to need some more steel to reinforce this, Chief. The Chief said, Okay, get him what he needs and get Jake off to see the doctor the medical. Officer Benjamin said to the Chief, Damn, man, that was close. You know what's going to happen. If just one of those things get loose in here, more people will get killed by the crossfire, not counting what those assholes will do. I know. In the meantime... We keep rolling the dice. The peak team continued up the logging road. As they approached the intended location of their mission to raise some help on the radios or cell phones, the convoy of the team stopped, dismounted, and four set up perimeters, and two of them began the task of setting up some antennas. Once the antennas were erected and stable, Harley started clicking on the cell phone units. Four different cell services were selected, and there was one from each service. The security group scanned the area with night vision. No visual contacts were observed, and nothing as far as the telltale signs of these creatures were detected. In fact, the woods had the night sounds of usual, and no feeling of being observed was felt. A rather pleasant summer's night, if it wasn't for the crackle of the radios and the reality of why they were there. Contact was finally made with the higher authorities, and it took some convincing, but they felt good about the response from the Highway Patrol and the Oklahoma Emergency Management Office. They began to break down the equipment and loaded it into the trucks. Let's roll, boys, shouted Jameson. That seemed to be awful easy, didn't it? Harley said. I take it. Let's just hope those crack-headed monkeys got an off last time, Jameson said with a jest. Don't count on it. Harley replied. As the convoy rolled down the road on their seven mile trek back to the asphalt road and then back into town, the chief walked back to the CNC where Gary and Mrs. Kelly were manning the centre. And Gary said, Hey chief, the pig team boys did it. They got through. 
We heard from them on a radio making contact. The chief looked at Mrs. Kelly. Holy hell, it's about time we had some good news. Uh, the team is on its way down the peak and on their way back to us, Mrs. Kelly said with a smile. Well, I guess old Harley had something to contribute after all, the chief said. Yes, yes he did, Mrs. Kelly replied as she lit up a smoke. Dow reported to the chief that he had completed fortifying the locker room. He also informed the chief that the beast stopped banging on the plate still, but he could still hear them moving in the locker room. Just then, Jake re-entered the CNC, and Mrs. Kelly said, Jake, get your butt back to medical. We got this. And Jake replied, No, I need to stay busy. I need to do things, okay? But if I have to put you in a headlock, don't be mad at me. And Mrs. Kelly said with a chuckle, Hey, Gary, can I talk to you? Jake asked. Gary replied, Sure. They both walked out of the CNC and wandered up and onto the stage area next to the fireplace. What can I do for you, Jake? Gary said with curiosity. You were friends with Ron, right? We ran around from time to time. Was he close with someone or was he married? Jake asked. Well, he was close with someone. Uh, let's see how to say this. He had been seeing Rachel Feltz over in McAllister. She's a corrections officer at the prison. They have been seeing each other for about three years, Gary stated. Okay, can you get me her info? I'm going to have to tell her how Ron went out. She deserves to know, Gary replied. Well, Jake, I know Ron would appreciate you being delicate with her in this, Gary replied. He was a veteran. His life mattered because he fought for us all, Jake said somberly. I'll get the info as soon as I can, Gary replied. Thanks, Jake said, looking away from Gary. The sound of gunfire echoed down the chimney of the fireplace. Both Gary and Jake looked at each other with shock and surprise, and then the progressive booms of the first layer of the push ring shook the building. The radio on Gary's hip squawked. Alert! Alert! All personnel to the defensive positions! Alert! Alert! All personnel to the defensive positions! Mrs. Kelly announced. Gary took off to the CNC, with Jake following closely behind. Upon entering the CNC, Gary spoke with authority. Randy, what do we got? About five minutes ago, a group of about 70 or more of those things arrived in the area from the northeast. They started to charge the building and the rooftop firing positions opened fire. And then another group of about 40 or so arrived from the southeast. And they started charging as well. Stan had decided that it was now time to let them taste a little fire and determination. And so he detonated the first push ring. Randy said, continuing to look at the computer monitors. Gary and Jake looked at the array of monitors and flat screens, and the sight was one right out of Dante's Inferno. The flames were wrapping and whirling around the creatures and down the streets of the town proper. The beasts, some on fire, and some just running to escape the cyclonic effect of the fire. The cacophony of howls and screams of the creatures was deafening, and the stench of the beast's burning hair and flesh raped their nostrils. As the flames' orange-reddish colours faded, the camera caught the image of several of the buildings that were now on fire, and the certain destruction of the structures was realised. The ununiformed movements of the Gugwe agitated the Alphas as they struggled to regain control of their individual troops, and as they started to slash and push the pod members into mounting another attack. Seven to nine of the Gugwe broke away from the pack and bolted back down the main street and quickly moved out of town back to the tree line. One of the large alpha males followed them. Although the noise and the odour of the push rings was dominant, the population inside the safe site remained calm and continued to care and comfort each other. Gotta hand it to Stan. He knows how to throw a party, Jake said to Gary with a chuckle. Okay, it's time to start splitting melons. All right, snipers, you're clear to engage, Gary said into the microphone. The chief walked in and took all of the images in and said, How many do you think are still out there? Hard to tell, chief. Some are leaving and some are just arriving. It's a hose fest out there right now, Jake said. What's the status of the locker room? asked the chief. It's secure, but there are still those pieces of crap down there. and We have no way of knowing what happened. What's happening in there? said Jake. The cracks and the pops of the seven snipers on the roof began to reach the ears of those in the CNC. 
Jake, Gary, Randy, Mrs. Kelly and the Chief began to see on the monitors these monsters begin to collapse and die under the sniper fire. At uh, this time, the radios popped and filled the room with static-filled, half-recognisable voices. Randy picked up the mic, and as he was beginning to speak, the speaker boomed. We need help! We're under attack! Oh, oh son of a... Help! Help! Send reinforcements! Now! Send them now! Was that coming from the... As the chief was interrupted by Jake. The fucking roof! Grabbing the mic. All QRF to the roof! All QRF to the roof! Jake said with haste and disbelief, as he grabbed his weapon and gear and went running to the holding area where the QRF short for Quick Reaction Force was staged for use. The roof? How is that possible? asked the chief. And Randy said, I don't fucking know. And Gary barked, Roof CP, come in! Roof, come in! Static burned across the radio. And then, Command, command, this is Roof CP, command. They're coming out of the south chimney. Do you read? They are attacking from the basement through the goddamn chimney. Some unknown voice transmitted. As the QRF team of 35 men topped the stairs and exiting the roof access door, Jake exclaimed, We gotta keep those damn things away from the skylights at the north end. We can't let them even look at them, boys. The sight was unbelievable. The Gugway were battling and dying by feet and inches. The roof team was down by close to 50%. The QRF arrived just in time as the team began to take hold of the battle. The volume of fire increased geometrically, and Gugwe were dropping and falling all across the roof. Several men from the QRF reached the chimney, and as the beasts were popping out of the massive concrete structure, the team was blasting their brains out of the Gugwe as soon as they appeared. One of the men on the QRF approached the chimney with two makeshift fragmentation grenades. Made of flashbang cans, nuts, washers and ball bearings held together with clear packing tape. Stepping up to the chimney, pulling the pins and tossing them into the chimney. The grenades fell through the chimney and at about third way down, they passed and bounced off the climbing gugway. They then continued to fall for another two seconds and then detonated almost at the same time. And as the nuts, washers and ball bearings began their work and started tearing into the flesh and bone of the beast all up and down the chimney, while this was happening, the bodies of the beast began falling back through the shaft and crashing down onto the hearth of the fireplace in the basement of the locker room. The remaining Gugwe were in chaos. A few of them jumped into the coal chute and crawled out of the ground access. All of the Gugwe were cleared from the roof in about 25 minutes. The QRF team suffered minor wounds, but no fatalities. The sniper team suffered almost 80% losses. The remaining snipers remained at their post and engaging the targets while the QRF team took down the beasts. Jake looked out across the gym area, out and over the push rings and the charred area. Beyond there was burned out, about 17 burning cars and the smoking remains of at least 70 or 80 Gugway corpses. Occasionally, he observed several creatures running back and forth as they were being fired upon and taken down by the remaining snipers. The observation posts that were on the highest parts of the gym began reporting movement and creatures massing onto the east and northwest of the gym's location. Jake spoke into the radio. Gary, get ready, they're up to something. Get some eyes on it. Not long after that call, Ryan Emmers, a 17-year-old high school senior, came through the roof access door with his rotor-powered drone that had a camera on it. You want to take a look around, sir? Ryan said. Jake patted him on the back and nodded his head, yes. The drone took flight, and as it made its way to the next street over, where the night vision camera caught sight of a horrifying sight that appeared on the laptop screen. And it was what Jake described to the CNC as a horde of creatures, numbering in a neighborhood of 350 to 400 individuals. Ryan swung the drone back and forth over to the northwest and detected another horde of 250 to 300 individuals, Gary stated in shock of the moment, Holy fuck. Jake, you better send some of the QRF down here, because we're going to have to shore up our reaction time if those things make a breakthrough on our defences. Agreed, Jake said. I'll send at least 30 down to you. I need to keep a few up here just in case we need to increase our sniping capability. And on another note, Gary, there is nothing holy about what we're looking at. It's just a lot of fuck out there. Ryan brought his drone in and landed it. He said, 
I have some of the battery packs downstairs. I'm going to go get them. And Jake said, Okay. And off Ryan went. Jerry and Connor had been humping the woods around the mud park for hours, even in the dark, and hadn't seen nor smelled anything. They'd have changed batteries in the flashlights twice, and both were exhausted. Jerry said, Hey man, you don't have to stay out here. Why don't you go back and get some sleep? And Connor replied, You're staying. I know you and I'll be staying. I can't leave you out here to do this on your own, boy. The two of them were way off in the mud park property, and by their reckoning about two miles, and it's been nothing but woods, having only crossed one dirt logging road. When they broke the tree line and found themselves in a clearing that seemed to have been recently made, the beams of the flashlights fell upon what looked like to be one of those shipping containers that they put in stuff to ship overseas. They looked at each other and both said, This is weird. Jerry approached the long box-like structure and the doors were wide open. He pulled back to the sides of the box. Connor pointed his flashlight inside the box and, to his surprise, there was half a side of beef hanging in the back of the box. And Jerry said, What the hell is going on here? And Connor replied, Hey, look at the floor. It looks like a piece of metal plate and a spring, doesn't it? And Jerry's attention went to the doors, and each door had three springs pulled tight, and he said, Hey bud, this is a trap. Connor looked at him with concern. Well, what are they trapping? Jerry looked at him again. Those things. They know about them. Connor, they know, Bubba. Well, who's they? Connor asked. Jerry walked over to the left side of the box and pointed his light at the side of the box that had a stencil on it that read, US Government Property, and right underneath it, Defense Intelligence Agency, and under that was a warning, live cargo. This sent chills down their backs. What the hell had they stumbled into? They thought to themselves. Connor noticed the ladder that was welded onto the side of the box. He climbed up on and peeked over the edge of the top of the box. He saw compressed air tanks like the ones his dad had in his shop for, the cutting torch, and there were hoses that were running from the tanks to the grey box and then out of it, and they were attached to fittings that were all over the top of the box. And there was another box that was dark grey. It had an antenna and several lights on it that were illuminated. One said power, the other doors armed, and the last one said sedation armed. He climbed down and spoke in a very serious and nervous voice to Jerry. Brother, we gotta go. Now. Suddenly, the clearing was lit up like a football field on Friday night by the headlights of several vehicles parked in the wood line of the clearing. The boys panicked and ran towards the way they came into the clearing. They were just about to the wood line. When five heavily armed men, dressed in full combat tactical kit, appeared practically in front of them. The boys gasped, and one of the men said, What the hell do you boys think you're doing here? And Jerry tried to utter the words, but he was just too scared. All right, guys, bag them, the man said. Four of the five men jumped both boys, taking them to the ground. A short fight ensued, and the boys' hands were zip-cuffed and black bags put over their heads, and because Jerry was kicking and screaming, both boys' legs were zip-cuffed, and then one zip-tie was used to hog-tie them both. As Connor lay there, on the ground, he soon felt a sharp sting of a needle in his right butt-cheek. About 45 seconds later, and everything went black. Jake stood on top of the air conditioning unit and surveyed the roof. The guys were picking up the bodies of the Gugway and throwing them off the roof and the bodies of their dead. They were being wrapped up and cared for as best we could. And he was still trying to make sense out of this night. It was at this point Jake noticed the sound of what he perceived as locusts or cicadas. But it was louder and it seemed to be getting louder and louder. People in the gym were noticing it too and the volume increased yet again. Some people became lightheaded and either fainted or became dizzy. Jake felt his stomach roll like it was the worst nausea that you could ever imagine, if you had a bad case of the flu, that is. The sound increased and he saw one of the men turn to him, and tears were rolling down his eyes like he had just lost one of his children. And the sickening feeling was moving through the entire camp of the townspeople taking shelter in the gym. 
The sound increased yet again, and Jake's stomach seemed to knot and roll over. The pain of the spasm was intense, and others on the roof were reacting in much the same manner. Jake fell from the AC unit and was writhing in pain on the roof as he lost his bowels. The sound permeated the whole of the building. Children, infancies, young and old were all affected. And then, just as it started, it stopped. It was like a strong hand let go of his intestines and he was now able to breathe and sweat rolled off of him. His breathing was like that of a man running a marathon and he was shaken from the intense pain and adrenaline that was running through his system. And that's when he heard screaming howls of the Gugwe running towards the gym from the east-northwest. Dozens of beasts were locked on and making it for the gym doors. This was the attack that the men were waiting for. Some of the men on the roof were able to open fire on the creatures and some were still incapacitated. But the attack was on and Jake figured over half of the forces in the gym were so out of it that they would be ineffective. Clever fucks. Jake said with a slight bit of admiration. And then Jake felt the building shake, pitch and roll. The stand kicked off the second push ring of all 22 barrels and they detonated in sequence with each other. The sound and the orange reddish flare enveloped him even up on the roof. He could feel the thermal shockwave. After a few seconds, he peeked over the parapet of the roof and the sight of these creatures, hundreds of them, running in every direction and on fire. It made him feel validated for helping Stan push through this idea. It was just then, some movement caught his eye, and he realised three Gugwe crawled out of the chimney, and were attacking several of the incapacitated men. His weapon snapped up, and he dropped one of the beasts with two rounds to the head, both rounds striking the same eye orbit. Some of the other men began firing on them as well. He grabbed two men and said, We cannot let them get to the skylights. They cannot get past us. Two other men came up through the roof access door and joined Jake and the others. Jake's sights cleared and it's in four more Gugwe climbed out of the chimney. He reached for his radio mic on his left shoulder. Command! Command! This is Roof CP! Roof! <coughs> he coughed. CP! He yelled back into the mic. This is Command! Gary shouted back. Listen, we're going to lose the roof. You need to get everyone into the fallback. Do you understand? Jake was trying to stay calm, enough so he could convince Gary. Gary, you have to get everyone into the fallback right now! Now, Gary! He heard the buzzer on the gym scoreboard go off, and that was the signal for the fallback. Oh, it's going to take at least 12 to 15 minutes to get everyone down there, Gary informed Jake. Well, do the best we can, brother, Jake said as he was dropping his signed picture onto an advancing Gugwe. Watch out for the Boogeyman. Connor woke up, his head was pounding, thirsty and he was freezing. As he came out of the drug's grip, he started to realise that he was in a room. That was covered in stainless steel, the floor, walls, ceiling, and there was three bright white lights in the ceiling and there was some kind of vent in the same wall that the door was on. The rest of the room was bare, except for the hole in the floor, which was apparently the drain. It was frigid in the room, and he could not figure out why he was naked and shaking almost uncontrollably in this room. There were puncture marks on his arm, like when the doc would take a blood sample. His throat was sore like something had been jammed down it. He had to piss, so he used the drain, and when he started to urinate, it burned some blood came out of his urine. Then there was the other thing that he didn't want to admit to himself, because he just didn't want to come to terms with the reality of it. His butt hell felt, well, it felt sore, and when he went back to fill the area in question and pulled his fingers back with a clear slick fluid on them. Oh, damn it, man! That is some freaky butt stuff to me. Oh, fuck! He said out loud as his breathing rate increased. Luck favours the bolt. So does running for your life. Jake, Jake, we got everybody in. Get down here. Jake, get down here. Gary shouted with agitation into the handheld walkie-talkie. Jake yelled out to the remaining men still in the heat of battle with these abominations of the natural world. The men and Jake began the task of exfilling down the fullback. They encountered at least two more Gugwe in the building 
after hearing the skylights break and one of the men received what would later become a fatal wound. As they entered the fallback, Jake was the last to enter. He closed a heavy steel door that had been reinforced by Dale during the build out of the gym. Jake placed the 3x2 boards in the hooks that were welded onto the side of the door frame, using plate steel to secure the hook to the concrete wall with the expansion bolts. The top, middle and bottom of the door was done in this fashion. The concrete seam of the floor was the absolute line for Jake. And he said, Brothers, after a long breath, This is it, pointing at the seam line. They don't pass this line. No further, no matter what. No further. The men settled with resolve, in their hearts and souls, that these beasts will not move any further, even if death arrives with them. This ain't gonna be no amusement ride. These monsters are real. The caravan moved down the rough and treacherous logging road, and after about a mile and a half of the follow-on truck lost its rear axle, so now all six men and some of the equipment was now being carried by the lead truck. Harley was in the truck bed standing behind the cab with Andy and Tracy, while Jameson, Big Mike and Floyd were in the cab. Floyd had insisted on driving, even with his injured shoulder. The caravan was no longer a caravan, it was a one-way, armed to the teeth chariot home, and every one of these guys was going to get home. The truck rolled across the ridgeline, and Harley banged on the top of the cab, and the truck came to a stop. He looked off to the south of their position, and observed multiple flashes of red and orange light coming from the town. As the first push ring detonated, it lit up the sky. Woo, I ain't seen that since Afghanistan, Jameson said. Nope, me either. Hope they're okay, Tracy said with a reverence to the situation. The team was all watching when the concussions of the blast reached them, and Big Mike said, Is that what I think it is? And Harley replied, Yep, the party has started. Let's roll, boys, as he banged on the cab again. The door latch clicked and opened. And Jerry was naked and huddled in the corner of a brightly lit stainless steel room, staring into the wall, crying and rocking back and forth, shaking. He never noticed the man walking up to him, the man dressed in dark and grey digital pattern camouflage in a black advanced Adidas GSG-9 boots. He knelt and touched Jerry's left shoulder. Jerry jumped and screamed, pushing his back up against the wall, so tightly that a molecule of air couldn't squeeze in. His face was filled with pure terror and fright. Tell me, Jerry, what did you see? The man said in a calm, controlled, uncaring low voice. What did you see, young man? Jerry breathing heavy and lips quivering, uttered quietly, t t tiger tiger I saw a tiger, while whimpering. The man responded by saying, Good, that's very good. And then Jerry asked, Can, can I go home now? With a voice of broken spirit, an unresolved fear. Not just yet. One more session. And we'll seal the deal. The man said while walking away from him back to the door. Jerry erupted, screaming and begging and pleading and crying. No, no, I've done everything. I I've done everything you wanted, dude. No, please, please let me go home. Please let me go. I've done everything, man. I've done everything. As he clambered and scrambled to the door, just as it closed, and he began pounding on it with his fists and hands, continuing to plead for anything, anything other than going back to room G-0601. Jerry then collapsed, slowly sliding down the metal door, crying, <laughs> Please, please, please. <laughs> 